This module is on feminist legal theory. By the end of this module, you will have knowledge of what feminist legal theory is, the dominant first three generations of feminist legal theory in the West, and the critiques of these theories. You will also learn why these theories matter in the contemporary world. You will be able to form your own opinion about which theory you feel is the most appropriate for understanding how and where women's rights are placed and how they are understood in law. This module relies on the works of Martha Chamelas and Carol Gilligan to present a comprehensive introduction to the topic. Feminist legal theory is the analysis of law from a feminist or women's rights based perspective. Feminist legal theory is used to, as a tool as it helps to develop reforms to correct gender exploitation, injustice or restrictions of either the articulation or implementation of women's rights within society. Although there are a variety of different theories which have very different approaches on the subject matter, they work on a few common normative assumptions. The notion that men and women are of equal legal and moral worth and that they have a right to non-discrimination and to have their rights fulfilled under the law is the common basis to all theories. Many feminists believe that the current articulation of the human in human rights law has the male as the universal rights holder and is therefore male-centric. Universal rights within domestic and international human rights law therefore do not always fully represent women's lived experiences or needs. The construction and articulation of law has therefore been largely criticised by feminists. To understand why a feminist critique of law has emerged, this module will examine the socio-economic status of women in the West in the 1950s before then examining how the feminist movement chose to engage with the law to seek reform. The module will then examine the three generations of feminist legal theory before ending with questions posed for the future. In effect, this module aims to provide a her-story approach to recent history and to present a gender-sensitive perspective for rights. There are several types of feminist legal theory. Many contemporary political identities and social issues evolve around conflicting claims of disparate identities involving different groups of women. And since the conception of identity influences in many ways our thoughts and actions, this becomes relevant for understanding why the generations emerged. Since the 1950s, women have been trying to have their voices heard and their needs represented within domestic and international law. Women's collective demands have evolved over time, becoming more complicated and nuanced to the different needs different women have and how these could be better accommodated within legal frameworks. As each dominant voice has evolved, it has also been labelled as a generation. This module will examine three significant generations. The three generations followed will be equality or liberal feminism, difference feminism and intersectional feminism. There are, of course, many other forms of feminism, such as socialist feminism, black feminism, eco-feminism, post-structural feminism, and trans feminism. The following module will introduce the reader to cultural, radical, and black feminism. This will enable the reader to become familiar with the core theories and to understand both the perspective the theories were coming from at the time they were evolved, and how their arguments were articulated, and why new theories developed. It will also enable you to navigate the diverse and sometimes contradictory arguments of feminist scholars. Each of the successive generations aims to have a response and critique to the previous generation, and it tries to fill the gaps which were not guaranteeing or including all women substantive equality. By presenting the theories as generations, the reader can successfully locate the strengths as well as the shortcomings of the various interpretations of feminist legal theory and form opinions about what suits their perspectives and their needs better. These theories have been developed in the Western context and catered to the needs of those women who wrote them and campaigned for their implementation. An example of how generations of feminism did not exist in a linear way is demonstrated by two examples. For example, in India, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay was campaigning not just for an end to patriarchy and the oppression of women by men, but also for the end of imperialism and how they were fighting in India both patriarchy 
and colonialism as two forms of coexisting oppression. In the UK, the suffrage, as in seeking the right to vote, movement, commonly referred to as the suffragette movement, started to gain significant momentum in 1903 when Emmeline Pankhurst formed the Women's Social and Political Union. The movement for women's equality in the UK can, however, be traced back to 1817 when Jeremy Bentham's plan for parliamentary reform was presented in Parliament. In this, he stated that women should have the right to vote. In 1865, John Stuart Mill was elected to Parliament and whilst campaigning for his election, he also pledged to fight for rights for women. In 1918, the Representation of the People Act was passed, giving some women the right to vote. This was then amended and extended the right to vote for all women over the age of 21 in 1928. Internationally, lobbying efforts also meant that the Convention for Political Rights of Women came into force in 1954. This also demanded that women be allowed to vote on an equal basis with men internationally. By the 1950s to 60s, women in the West largely had the right to vote, but now they were seeking broader protections from the law, such as legal rights and wider implementation from their governments to enter and remain in the workforce, particularly post-marriage and pregnancy, and to regulate the surrounding promotions, pay, benefits and rewards of employment. It was at this time that the women's voice became so unified and with a clear line of thought defining not just what should be demanded from the state, but also on what basis, that a feminist legal theory was developed. The first generation, equality feminism, sometimes referred to as liberal feminism, is seen as the original theory in feminist legal theory. This generation lays emphasis on women's similarity to men. It works on the idea that gender should be irrelevant to the distribution of legal benefits and burdens. Women were frustrated with being pigeonholed into administrative and secretarial positions within the workforce. Gender stereotypes, dominant in the era that the theory was developed in, assumed that women were not capable of being in decision-making or managerial positions because they were not able to handle stress as well as men could, or that women's priorities were in getting married and bearing and nurturing children and maintaining the marital home. The common belief was therefore either that women were uninterested in seeking positions of authority within the workforce or that they would not be able to commit the hours. When women were unable to rise beyond a certain level of employment, typically because of gender stereotypes that influence people's expectations of their abilities, this is called the glass ceiling. A further frustration of women was that they typically received a lower salary for the same type and quantity of work as their male peers, even when they had similar qualifications and worked the same number of hours. This is called the gender pay gap. Women, therefore, fought to have their skills and abilities recognised on an equal level as men. They wanted, and felt that they deserved, access to the same types of opportunities and benefits as men did and that they should be allowed access to all public institutions. This generation of feminist legal theory is known to accept the language and aims of laws as they existed, but wanted women to be more included and represented within the existing structures. This was based on the argument that women are equal to men regarding their skills, intellectual abilities and capacity to do the same jobs for the same economic rewards. This premise reinforces the liberal feminist legal theory's claim that most of the arguments arise from the idea of individual rights. Their main objective is to implement the law as based equally for all individuals. As women were frustrated at not having the same opportunities as men, this theory focused on trying to eliminate differences and gender-based stereotypes between men and women's abilities. The liberal feminists' main aim was therefore to dismantle the sex-based legal distinctions that had been established purportedly to protect women, but that served to exclude them from positions within the workforce. Equality feminists, in their efforts to prove the sameness to men, 
also chose to criticize stereotypes perceived as natural differences between men and women that served to underrepresent women in managerial positions or in political participation and their overrepresentation in care work. As liberal feminists fought to be seen as the same as men and to have the same rights that already existed as men, they have often been called assimilationists. They assimilated to a pre-existing model of rights. They tended to not challenge the standards, rules or structures themselves, but to focus instead on equal access within the same framework. As this generation of thought simply adds women to the existing language of laws which already existed, it is often also called the add women and stir approach, as women are being added to the pre-existing structure, but the original substance, for example law, is not substantially changing. Liberal feminism has been critiqued for many reasons. First, as the theory does not call for substantive change within the law, but only the adding of women to existing protections, it has been criticised for only benefiting women to the extent that they want or are able to assimilate and conform to the expected behaviour of middle-class privileged men. Second, liberal feminism has been critiqued for essentializing all women as being the same, with the same set of needs, aspirations and a starting point within society. For example, it assumes that all women have the same socio-economic resources, educational qualifications and level of acceptance by employers. This doesn't recognise differences between women and their different needs. Third, as men are physically unable to become pregnant and socially were not expected to be primary caregivers due to powerful gender stereotypes, pregnancy and childbirth and time off work for the same were not given. Even with the changes in law that liberal feminism introduced, it did not therefore ensure equality for women with men throughout their careers. Once women started to be given the same rights as men to enter the workforce and be considered for promotions, enter positions of authority and earn higher pay, they soon realised that there were other obstacles that hadn't previously been identified that needed to be overcome to enable women to retain their positions. When women wanted temporary leave from work for maternity, they found that no special protections existed to protect their position within employment. The battle for women to secure equal rights as men within the workforce and public sphere had been won, but women now realised whilst being equal intellectually to men, they were differently physically, and the structure surrounding their daily lives needed to be more accommodating. The second generation of feminist legal theory, difference feminism, rooted its arguments on the basis though the equality approach had helped women get more rights than they previously had and more access to the workforce. The basis that men and women were equals in every sense was faulty. The concept of sameness between men and women was questioned, resulting in the articulation of the male bias or androcentric theory. Both of these concepts recognise that law as it existed before and after the generation of feminist legal theory is gender blind. It didn't recognise the differences between men and women, for example, reproductive functioning. Difference feminism recognises men and women as being equals but with physical differences which result in a different set of needs. Difference feminism asserts that within law and other social power structures within society, the male norm is seen as the primary starting point of reference for all articulations of rights. In order for some women to therefore have the same rights as men, they can only benefit as much as they assimilate to the male or androcentric model. It highlights the male bias and male norms in rules, standards and concepts that appear neutral or objective. Rules designed to fit male needs, male social biographies or male life experiences. The second generation of feminism challenges the possibility of women being able to effectively assimilate into an inherently male model and aims to address the shortcomings of assimilation to enhance actual substantive equality. In order for women's needs to be recognised and then met, different feminists introduce the question of the woman question. The woman question prompts decision makers and people interpreting and or drafting legislation to question whether women's needs are met within existing law or a law that is being drafted. 
It recognizes that women have a distinctive set of needs and that if women are subjected to gender-blind law, meaningful substantive quality will not be achieved. Asking the woman question has allowed any gender-neutral or gender-blind law that disproportionately discriminates against women to be read as not achieving equality or, in domestic courts, as unconstitutional. It has helped to expand equality provisions and prompted the emergence of equality impact assessments in some countries to ensure policy or legal decisions do not disproportionately affect one gender or group of people over another. Whilst women had started entering the formal workforce in greater numbers, their positions within the workforce remained vulnerable, especially during and post-pregnancy. Within employment law, demands for paid maternity leave were now articulated. Further, women wanted guarantees that the same job with the same responsibilities would be available to them upon their return to work. Demands for consideration for promotions and decision-making roles that do not discriminate against women who have taken breaks from the workforce for parental reasons were also made to try and ensure that women were not discriminated against. Legal responses to difference feminism include mandated maternity leave which gives women the legal right to pay time off work, to give birth and to nurture a baby and the right to return to her job after this has been completed. The Maternity Benefit Act from 1961 in India, amongst other provisions, includes protections for pregnant women or new mothers regarding their children's health, financial benefit and when they are not at work and protection of their positions. Paragraph 4, subsection 3 states, No pregnant woman shall, on a request being made by her in this behalf, be required by her employer to do any work which is of an arduous nature or which involves long hours of standing or which in any way is likely to interfere with her pregnancy or the normal development of the fetus, or is likely to cause her miscarriage or otherwise to adversely affect her health. This is a recognition by the legislature of women's difference from men and how their working conditions and health can have a direct impact upon an unborn child. Further, paragraph 5 states, Every woman shall be entitled to, and her employer shall be liable for, the payment of maternity benefit at the rate of the average daily wage for the period of her actual absence, immediately preceding and including the day of her delivery, and for six weeks immediately following that day. This provision recognises that new mothers need financial support when it will be difficult for them to return to work, and that due to nursing and the other physical impacts of childbirth, women need specific provisions not applicable to men. Paragraph 12 makes it unlawful for an employer to discharge or dismiss a woman who in accordance with the Act is not at work. Where a woman absents herself from work in accordance with the provisions of this Act, it shall be unlawful for her employer to discharge or dismiss her during or on account of such an absence. This provision protects women from losing employment because of a pregnancy and or childbirth and therefore recognises the vulnerability of women's positions and security within the workforce during this period that men do not experience. These provisions are for the exclusive benefit of pregnant women or new mothers. The Maternity Benefit Act therefore recognises women's difference from men regarding reproduction and accommodates this within the legislation. As of the 1st of April 2017, several amendments have also come into force. The duration of maternity leave has been expanded from 12 to 26 weeks. Commissioning and adopting mothers are also entitled to leave and all employers with more than 50 employees are required to have a creche. It does not provide for parental, for example joint, or paternal, for the father, leave. Difference feminism is the dominant theory within the legislature and the judiciary within the West. Different countries have tried to accommodate biological differences between men and women that have resulted in disproportionate impacts against women within the workforce. The dominant critique of difference feminism is that whilst it recognises women's biological difference from men,
It does not recognize differences between women. The protections that difference feminism intended to provide were largely for the benefit of middle-class, white, heterosexual women engaged in formal employment. The theory, therefore, does not recognize structural disadvantages that black women face, for example, in their socioeconomic status, quality of education received, racism and discrimination in employment, nor does it consider the position of other sections of women who have less security, are not heterosexual, married, or physically differently abled. Another critique of difference feminism is that whilst it provides for protection such as maternity leave, this does not prevent women from still being discriminated against within employment regarding access to promotions and other rewards. It also does not promote structural change within society or the workforce. For example, within academia, in order to secure tenure, a faculty member must publish a certain number of publications within a fixed number of years. For primary caregivers who are overwhelmingly women, if they have a child during this time, they are automatically at a disadvantage, as when they are caring for a newborn and young child, they are unlikely to also be able to research and publish papers at the equal level as men. New York University in the USA has a policy whereby parents who are expecting a newborn child can apply to have their tenure clock, for example, the period of time within which publications must be made, stopped when their childcare parental leave starts and then restarted when they return to work. Whilst this is sympathetic to the reality that most carers for small children do not have the time to research and publish, the result is that the primary caregiver, who is more often than not the woman, who chooses to have a child and then look after it before it starts going to play school, will still need to publish five papers within now maybe six years, or if she has two children, within seven years. This means that if you become a parent but do not take leave, in this case you're overwhelmingly men, you will still have to publish five papers within five years. The result of this policy is that academics who do not take childcare leave are promoted faster and receive all the benefits such as higher salaries and increased job security and more influence within the workforce than those who do take childcare leave. Such policies contribute to the lack of representation of women at decision-making levels and their lower financial rewards within institutions and organisations globally. A more gender-sensitive and accommodating approach would be to consider the time for parental or family leave to be considered equal to that of one publication. For example, if you have published one less paper over a five-year period, but in that time you had or were the primary caregiver for a baby, your parental leave will be considered as equal to one paper. Employees who have had children will therefore not be negatively affected by their personal choices and will be recognised for their contributions to the workforce and their biological, for example, pregnancy and social, for example, parental care roles. Policies within the workforce that provide incentives for men to play a greater role in child rearing and provide high quality available childcare provision will also be structurally making the workforce more accommodative. Whilst the second generation of feminism responded to the gaps in equality feminist legal theory, the third generation, complex identities or intersectional feminism, also aimed to fill the gaps left by the first and second generation of feminism. The 1990s saw a shift in how difference was perceived. It moved from between men and women to between women. Third generation scholars identified that the first and second generations of feminism did not recognize structural disadvantage. Whilst they aimed to give women, as a group, more rights, it essentialized all women as one group who all had the same social position and shared the same barriers which prevented them from effectively realizing equality with men. The third generation of feminism articulated the lived experiences of a wider range of women and different coexisting identities that all intersected with one another to reinforce the discrimination they experienced or barriers they face to accessing the same opportunities. These include, but are not limited to, socio-economic status, sexual orientation, employment status, marital status, single mothers, ethnicity, race, 
religion, age, immigration status, geographic location, level of ability, and those differently abled. Recognizing that multiple forms of oppression coexist enabled women to embrace a more inclusive approach towards defining their broad range of lived experiences, perspectives, and identities by adopting a both and approach rather than an either or. This was very significant as the legal regime in place prior to this had been resistant to recognizing that multiple forms of discrimination could coexist and reinforce disadvantage and to subsequently provide redress. This can be seen in the de Graffin Reed et al. versus General Motors case referenced. Intersectional feminism moves beyond analysing discrimination on singular or mutually exclusive forms of discrimination, which enables people's lived realities and experiences of discrimination to be understood as often occurring due to multiple factors or aspects of their identity. The need for this encompassing stance is highlighted in the 1976 case of Emma de Graffin Reed and others versus General Motors Assembly in the American state of Missouri. De Graffin Reed, a black American woman, took her employer, General Motors, to court, claiming she had been discriminated against because of her sex and colour. She worked in a factory that employed 8,561 workers. Of these, black women were 1.81% of the workforce. As part of a cost-saving redundancies, all but one black woman, a janitor, lost their jobs. Black women comprise 7.10% of all of the redundancies. De Graffin Reed et al. claimed that they had been discriminated against both because they were black and because they were women. When the district court heard this claim, it stated, The plaintiffs are clearly entitled to a remedy if they have been discriminated against. However, they should not be allowed to combine statutory remedies to create a new super remedy which would give them relief beyond what the drafters of the relevant statutes intended. The judgment went on to ask whether a cause of action for race discrimination, sex discrimination, or alternatively either, but not a combination of both, had taken place. By choosing to adopt the either or, and not the both and approach, the court did not recognize the multiple levels of discrimination that women of color experience simultaneously both by virtue of their sex and colour. The active resistance and reluctance by the court to recognise the multiple forms of intersecting and coexisting discrimination, which reinforced the social disadvantage women of colour experienced, was furthered when the court said, the legislative history surrounding Title VII, which are anti-discrimination laws, does not indicate that the goal of the statute was to create a new classification of black women, who would have greater standing than, for example, a black male. The prospect of the creation of new classes of protected minorities governed only by the mathematical principles of permutation and combination clearly raises the prospect of opening a hackneyed Pandora's box. The court's resistance to the recognition of the situation of black women as a group as opposed to women or coloured people, is that they were not seen as a group that had coexisting identities. The court's decision demonstrates the lack of a gender-sensitive, rights-based approach to dispensing justice. This case reinforces how law, if it is interpreted and applied neutrally in the same way for different people, can be a source of injustice rather than justice. A critique of intersectional feminism would be that whilst intersectional feminism aims to unite all categories or distinctions, as they are often referred to, of a person's identity, and to recognise that individuals may often experience discrimination and disadvantaged, a critique of intersectional feminism would be that whilst intersectional feminism aims to unite all categories of a person's identity, and to recognise that individuals may often experience discrimination and disadvantage due to multiple coexisting factors. Critiques of the theory argue that as the theory aims to be inclusive of, multi of multiple factors, it loses sight of the specific circumstances and needs of certain groups. For example, if schools, workplaces and public offices are expected to have ramps to ensure that they are wheelchair accessible 
for differently physically abled people? Should they also be equipped with braille and signing facilities to be inclusive of blind and deaf people who are also clearly less physically abled? This theory demonstrates how even within disadvantaged groups there will be some people who are at a dominant position. For example, those who are in wheelchairs for whom ramps are provided will then be less disadvantaged than those who are unable to read braille or to have a sign language interpreter. Some commentators have also asked how, with only say six seats on a panel of ten positions on a board of directors, can half of humanity, with all of its differences, ever be represented? Essentially the test comes with trying to be as inclusive as possible and being aware of difference and trying to prevent forms of discrimination from affecting women's equality of opportunity and equality of results. This chapter has sought to explain what feminist legal theory is by looking at the first three dominant generations. It has also tried to understand women's rights and where they are placed and understood within law. It has touched upon some legal enactments present that protect women's rights. This module is now complete. Thank you.